I'm delighted to be here and to meet Geraldine Brooks. She's one of those rare artists about whom one has to marvel with a mixture of wonder and envy. Wonder at the range and force of her insights, envy that one person can be gifted with such energy and understanding. She was born in Sydney, raised in the western suburb of Ashfields, and was educated at a convent school and Sydney University. She began her journalism career at the Sydney Morning Herald. She later became a war correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, reporting on conflicts in the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. Her 1994 nonfiction examination of the lives of Muslim women, Nine Parts of Desire, became an international bestseller in 17 languages. With the birth of her first son in 1996, Ms. Brooks wisely decided that she no longer wanted to make a living in war zones, <laughs> for which we are all grateful, because she began to write novels. Her first novel, Year of Wonders, was published in 2001, set in the plague year of 1666. It's a story of what happened to the small English village of Eam when the Black Death Plague struck. Her second novel, March, told the Louisa May Alcott story from the point of view of Mr. March, the husband and father. It won a Pulitzer Prize in 2006. Her latest novel, just published, is Caleb's Crossing. Again, rooted in history, as are her other novels, Caleb's Crossing tells the story of the first Native American to graduate from Harvard University in 1665. The narrator at the novel's opening is 12-year-old Bethia Mayfield, the daughter of a Puritan preacher on the island of Martha's Vineyard. Bethia is a restless, yearning young woman who desperately wants to learn everything she can, this at a time when a woman's education was confined to the Bible and the catechism. The novel effortlessly traces the relationship between the young so-called savage and the young fervent Christian. It is a remarkable piece of work. Ladies and gentlemen, the remarkable Geraldine Brooks. Thank you, Michael. You're not allowed to say so many nice things about me because you'll give me a big head. And in that case, they'll take away my Australian passport because we're not allowed to have those there. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much all, all for coming out uh, on this very lovely bright day. Um, uh, I'm just going to read a very short um, piece from Caleb's Crossing, and then we're going to get talking, and then I hope we'll have a conversation all together. And excuse these really ridiculous glasses that I have to wear. I'm down to my last pair of reading glasses, and uh, I had to buy these in a hurry, and I didn't notice how silly they were. Um, I found that every time I get on a plane, the plane seat eats my glasses. It's happened again yesterday. <laughs> this is in the voice of uh, young Bethia, and she's been told that she's not allowed to um, study because it risks addling her wits and because women's minds are not formed for the higher learnings. So she studies in secret. She steals her brother's textbooks when she's sent out to do errands. And she tries to learn uh, from nature, studying the natural history of the island. On one bright day, when the weather had warmed and steadied, I rode speckle to the south shore. The prospect is remarkable there where the wide white sands run uninterrupted for many leagues. I watched the heaving waves, smooth as glass, unspooling down the rim of my known world. I dismounted, untied my boots, stripped my hose, and let the sea foam froth about my toes. I led the mare along the rack line, studying white shells shaped like angels' wings. I picked up scallop shells in diverse colors and sizes warm reds and yellows, cool, stippled greys, and reflected on the diversity of God's creation and what might be the use and meaning of his making so many varieties of a single thing. If he created scallops simply for our nourishment, why paint each shell with delicate and particular colours? And why, indeed, trouble to make so many different things to nourish us? 
When in the Bible we read that a simple manna fed the Hebrews day following day, it came to me then that God must desire us to use each of our senses to take delight in the varied tastes and sights and textures of his world. Yet this seemed to go against so many of our preachments, against the sumptuary and the carnal. Puzzling upon it, I had walked some good distance, head down, inattentive to all but my thoughts, when I glanced up and saw them far off, a band of them, painted strangely as I had been told they did for war, running headlong up the beach in my direction. I grasped Speckle's bridle and urged her in all haste into the dunes, which were high and undulant and concealing. I was cursing my folly to find myself alone, far from help, and my mare, hard-ridden, fairly spent. But in the lee of the dune, protected from the wind, the voices of the band carried toward me. They were laughing and calling out one to another. The sounds were of merriment, not warfare. Taking care that Speckle remained well concealed, I fell down upon my belly and crept along to a parting between the sand hills from whence I could look back along the beach. I saw then what my first fear had obscured from me. They were unarmed, carrying neither bow nor war club. I raised a hand to shade my eyes against the glare and could make out a small sphere of tied-up skins which they were kicking high into the air, and I knew then that they were about some kind of game. I had to look away then, for they were clad in Adam's livery. <laughs> Fortunately, they were so intent on their game that they had not seen me. I led Speckle some distance to where I was sure the height of the dune would conceal me if I remounted. I needed to do the chore I had been sent out for, to gather sufficient clams for our chowder kettle. So when I had put some distance between myself and the beach, I tied Speckle to a great piece of driftwood, unfastened the rake from the saddle, hitched my skirt high, and waded into the brine. It soon proved a poor place, and I was about to give up and try another spot when I felt eyes upon me. I straightened and turned, and saw him for the first time, the boy we now call Caleb. He was standing in a thicket of tall beech grass, his bow slung over one shoulder, and some kind of dead waterfowl in the bag at his back. Something, perhaps the expression on my face, perhaps my frantic tugging at my skirt, amused him, for he smiled. He was a youth of my own age, some two or three years younger than the warriors at play upon the beach. Unlike them, he was clad for hunting, wearing a kind of deerskin breech clout tied with a belt fashioned of snakeskins. To this was laced a pair of leggings. Around his upper arms were twines of beadwork, cunningly worked in purple and white. All else about him was open and naked, save for three glossy feathers tied into a sort of topknot in his thick, jetty hair, which was very long, the forelock pulled hard back from his coppery face and bound up as one might dress a horse's mane. His smile was unguarded, and something in his expression made it impossible to fear him. Still, I thought it prudent to retrieve my mare and get away from this place which seemed to be teeming with salvages of one sort or another. Who could say what outlandish person might next appear? I gathered up my soaking skirt and made for the shoreline. Unfortunately, in my haste, I caught my toe in a thicket of eelgrass and tripped into the water, spilling the few clams I had gathered and soaking my sleeves and bodice to match my sodden skirt. He was beside me in a few long strides, a hard brown grip on my forearm as he pulled me out of the water. In his own language, I asked him to let go. His hand dropped from my arm. I made my way, dripping, to shore. He stood where he was, fixed to the spot by his own astonishment. It was my turn, then, to struggle against a smile. I think it would not have surprised him more had my horse addressed him. <laughs> that was wonderful, and I think I should tell our audience that it's even more wonderful considering you were 20 hours in an airplane yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I came from Auckland, so 
Yeah, Auckland. Jet lagged a bit, are we? Or? Um, probably so. <laughs> Before we talk about Caleb and the novel, I, I want to ask you about uh, something I caught from some of your other books. You have a thing for the 1600s. I do have a thing for the 1600s. 1666 for Year of Wonder. This is 1660. Why is that? I think it's where you can sense the modern mind starting to emerge from the medieval mind. But the victor in the struggle isn't yet clear. So when you read writings from the 17th century, the people are suddenly like us, they're recognizable, they have the same kind of wit and irony and cynicism. And yet, on the other hand, there's still this incredible sort of superstition that per pervades everything. Um, I love the, the dichotomies of you, in the same year that you've got Isaac Newton inventing calculus, you've still got witches being burned at the stake. And it's like the old way is still grabbing at people's heels and trying to pull them back into medieval thinking. But choosing that and choosing that time means perforce, I guess, that you have to immerse yourself in research. It, that's the fun part. That's the fun part? <laughs> I heard you say perforce, so you're already, you know, you're already starting to... <laughs> I have that trouble all the time when I'm working on these books. The other day, my, uh, <coughs> we have a rule that you're not allowed to play lacrosse in the house, which I think is a very <laughs> reasonable one, but my two sons started, you know, and I got really irritated, and I heard myself yelling at them, you are vexing me with your ungirt behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, when you were in, in the year of wonder about the plague, um, there are parts in the in the novel where you really really have trouble because it's so graphic about what happens to you when you get the the plague and so mm. on, and all of the medicinal elements of it. The, how did you go about doing doing that? You just sit down at a medical library for six months, or no? I never do it in big gobs like that. I always try and let the story tell me what it is that I need to know. Because I think if you do great indigestible swatches of research, the risk is you'll think, oh, that is so very interesting. I must find a way to move the story so I can include it. Whereas if you let the story go along and then you come to something like in the bit I just read, I imagined that he would be hunting. And then I realized I have no idea what a Wampanoag hunter would have worn. So I go and just get that bit and then come back and put it in. But how do you get the language and the words, mm. the phrases? I can't, I can't uh, give an example, but it sent me to the dictionary to find out what the heck does that mean? And the, how did you, the way that people talk and to each other and so on. So that is one of the things that I do before I start writing is I read everything that I can find that was written in that time and place. And in the 17th century, that doesn't take very long, generally speaking, because people were so busy surviving, they didn't have time to write. It's very, you know, so the 1860s was a different kettle of fish, right. where Emerson and Thoreau and Alcott were banging on interminably about their thoughts and their feelings, and you know, and you can sense how life has, has expanded by the 19th century to allow people time to be thoughtful and reflective. That's why the people in March talk differently than the people in the... Yeah, that they're very, you know, it's Victorian and it's flowery and everything. Whereas back in the 17th century, um, there, are, there are fewer surviving documents, but the ones that there are tend to be, you know, the, the, the idea of God pervading everything is the first thing that you notice. But in terms of the language, so these beautiful bright shards of their grammar and the way they express themselves start to lodge in your brain and eventually somebody, I, I think of it as my friendly ghost, will rise up from the grave and start talking to me. And I can hear her and I can hear how she sounds. And that's the crucial moment when, when I know there will be a novel or there won't be one. Because if nobody wants to talk to me, I'm not going to be able to start writing. Why do you like the idea of a narr having a narrator, uh, a young girl narrator, Bethia in, in Caleb's Crossing, and is it Anne in? Anna, yeah, Anna Anna's a Europe little one. bit older at the start of the novel, but not very much. And um, well, each of them comes from a different little shard of fact. 
Anna was suggested to me by a half-line reference in one of the few documents that was actually written in the village of Eam during the year that the village quarantined itself. And that's a true story. It was the only village that uh, ever voluntarily quarantined itself to stop the spread of the plague into surrounding communities. What normally happened was people ran for their lives if they could. And so in, in one of the vicar's letters, he has a line that says, fortunately, my maid continued in health, which was a blessing, for had she quailed, I would have been ill set. And I was immediately interested in who that maid had been, and there was nothing about her on the historical record. So I imagined her, and I imagined her as the young widow of a lead miner, because lead mining was the main occupation in that town. And with Bethia, the shard was, uh, came out of uh, a little bit of fact about when um, Caleb left Martha's Vineyard Island to go to prep school on the mainland. Another young Wampanoag named Joel went with him, and the third person was the son of the minister on Martha's Vineyard, whose actual name was Matthew Mayhew. And Caleb and Joel succeeded and matriculated to Harvard. They became fluent in Latin, which you had to be because all the instruction was in Latin at Harvard in those days. But Matthew crapped out, and he went back to the island without matriculating. And that suggested to me a family story, that maybe he was ashamed of his inability to do what these Indian youths had done, and that maybe he blamed his father for getting so involved in the project of educating the Indians that he hadn't spent enough time on his own son's education. And I thought, who would be able to see that clearly uh, without having a horse in the race? And I thought it would be the sister. <laughs> 